Let's talk about soot formation in diesel engines. In some respects, this is not unique to diesel engines, but it is one that uniquely affects diesel engines. So let's talk about it in a bit of detail. Now, in the previous lesson, we talked about the fact that varnish, sludge, and deposits can form in basically three different ways. The first is that you get lubricant that oxidizes, you create oxy compounds, these polymerize, you get varnish and sludge. Second way is you get sulfur compounds. These undergo oxidation and hydrolysis. They produce sulfur compounds, which polymerize into varnish and sludge. There is also another pathway, um, which is kind of nitration, in which nitrogen compounds oxidize, and then you get nitrogen compounds, which also polymerize. And then finally, you have fuel, which doesn't undergo complete combustions. We have incomplete combustion, which produces soot, right? And then that soot agglomerates and forms deposits. We went through the first two in the previous lesson, so now we're going to concentrate on this last track. All right, so let's consider the differences between a spark ignited and a compression ignited engine. So obviously with the spark ignited engine, right, it's the spark that's initiating the the uh, kind of the, the ignition, right? Um, in a diesel engine, it's obviously not the case. We're just spraying fuel directly into the combustion chamber, and it's the compression of the air-fuel mixture which is causing it to ignite. And of course, that rapid... Uh, the, the rapid compression is what is generating a lot of that heat. So let's consider how we need uh, or, or what the purposes of that injection are, right? With a, with a fuel injector, we, we want to accomplish a few things. Firstly, we want to atomize the fuel because let's say, for example, I just poured some fuel in. That would be the worst case scenario. I would have a layer of fuel and a layer of air because the fuel would sit on the low side being more dense than air. And when I went to ignite the mixture, they're not mixed, right? So I'm not going to get combustion. So that's what you want is you want it to basically, the, the injector, you want it to spray almost like a very, very, very fine mist of fuel. That's your objective is to have it as evenly dispersed throughout that air as possible. And so what you want in an ideal scenario is a com if I looked at any part of the combustion chamber, the ratio of air to fuel would be exactly the same. Now, in practice, we don't get that, right? We get localized pockets where there might be a little bit more fuel than another pocket. And that's because no diesel injector can be perfect at its job. Now, we've made some changes around piston design to help, you know, um, the, this dispersion of, of fuel. So as an example, right, you, if you took a cross section of a lot of uh, uh, diesel pistons, what you'll generally see is uh, a kind of shape to them that looks maybe something like this, right? And the purpose there is to promote swirl, right? We're trying to ensure that when the fuel is injected, it swirls around and we get turbulent flow as much as possible to try and even out the distribution of that fuel. However, no fuel injection system is perfect, and we're always going to end up with localized areas where it's kind of fuel rich. So what's the effect of something being fuel rich? Well, when we look at our general equation for combustion, what we're doing is we're taking fuel and we're combining it with oxygen. We're then obviously igniting it, and what we're producing is energy, which we want, um, exhaust, which is kind of undesirable products, right? Now, what happens if I reduce the amount of oxygen? Right? So in a local area, I have more fuel than is needed than oxygen. Well, ultimately what that means is there's not going to be enough oxygen to burn all the fuel, and I'm going to end up with some fuel in my exhaust. Right? So fuel plus heat is undergo, un, going to undergo some transformation. Right? And you know, at the very, very high temperatures that we see in combustion chambers, what we see is thermal degradation of the fuel, thermal cracking of the fuel, if you like. What that effectively means is that I, if I have long hydrocarbon chains, right? remember that these are all surrounded by hydrogens, but I'm going to remove those just for simplicity's sake. I'm giving this molecule so much energy that it's going to literally break it apart. And what I tend to have is I, I tend to have something which breaks apart into smaller kind of volatile compounds. right? So that's what I'm doing. right? I'm taking these long hydrocarbon chains which make up diesel fuel, and even though they're not they're not combusted, the, the high temperature in the combustion chamber is going to break them apart. Now what they can do is they can start to recombine, right? 
Uh, this is something that is uh, very familiar to people who who understand the thermal degradation process, right? We, we, we're breaking things apart and then those broken compounds then want to recombine and what we call polymerize. Typically what they'll do in um, soot molecules is that they'll combine into what we call PAHs, which is polyaromatic poly hydrocarbons, right? And as they combine together, right, they'll also combine with um, some sulfur, maybe from the, the fuel, so elemental sulfur. They'll combine them with some oxygen from the air. They might combine with some phosphorus from the anti-wear package or something. And they'll form these kind of little, uh, like a, it's almost like a cell, right? Now, these cells are slightly polar. And so they'll also want to attract themselves to other cells that are almost the same. And effectively, what they'll do is they'll start to stack together. And as they stack together more and more, right, I'm going to represent them like this. This is what we start to, to call the beginnings of soot agglomeration. So you might have heard that term. Soot particles like to stick together. And so over time, what you get is these cells. Um, remember, this is all happening in a matter of, you know, a couple of you know, milliseconds, right, in the combustion chamber. All of these things are going to start to agglomerate together. And eventually what they, what they form is kind of like a, a, a nice round micelle, right? All right. Now, a couple of these micelles might start to come together as well and agglomerate into something a little bit larger. Now, my computer is going to have a little bit of trouble um, keeping up with this because <laughs> the amount of animation that it's having to do is a little bit onerous. But what we're going to start to get is these cells almost sticking together like glue. Now, why is that um, a significant problem? Soot is not itself um, that harmful to our engine. Like, if you think about it, uncombusted fuel... Is fuel that dangerous? It's not. It's not a hard contaminant. It's not abrasive. It's not erosive. So that in itself is not dangerous. It's when these particles start to agglomerate together and they form a larger abrasive particle that it becomes a problem. It's a little bit similar to like um, uh, silica, right? You know, one molecule of uh, silicon oxide is not really going to be all that dangerous. But when silicon, lots of silicon oxide molecules come together and they form a big polymer, that's a sand grain, right? And we know how much damage sand grains can do to our engine. So in a similar way, you get this, this growth of a soot particle and it ends up in the engine, right? Now, a couple of pl places that it can go. It can either go into the exhaust, which we don't mind so much, right? Because now it's, it's disappearing off the atmosphere. Or it can get into the crankcase and it can start to work its way around the engine. And that's when it gets... A little bit more dangerous right now if it goes into the exhaust it's going to contribute to particulate matter so one of the major components of particulate matter is actually soot and we generally have to deal with that because we don't want it just going out the tailpipe we generally deal with that with you know our, our dpf kind of system so the diesel particulate filter and of course the more soot that you create then uh, the more often that you're going to have to do a dpf burn Right, and that reduces uh, the efficiency of your engine. Now, on the wear side, like I said before, what we don't want is for all these soot particles to come and um, uh, what we call agglomerate, so start to connect to each other. This is going to cause them to become abrasive. And so what we do with the lubricant formulations is we have these things called dispersants in them. And the objective of dispersants is to encapsulate these soot molecules before they can rapidly grow, right? And so... When, when they're in this state and they've been encapsulated by our dispersants, then they're rendered what we would more or less say is inert. So one thing to look for in your used oil analysis results is to look at the trend between soot and your metals, right? So generally what we would say is that you could put either soot or hours or the equipment hours on the x-axis because if you're producing soot, right, you're producing it usually at a pretty regular rate. And so soot and hours are going to line up you know, pretty well. So as soot increases, what you expect to see is more metals, specifically probably iron and aluminium if you've got aluminium pistons, right? So as you're producing soot, if it's abrasive, it's going to start to wear components in the engine and you'll start to see those show up on ICP metals. What you don't want to see is something that looks like this, right? Where the rate is very, very high. Because what that means is that the dispersant package is probably not doing its job adequately, right? And different lubricants, the way that they're formulated and the quality of the lubricant will determine what that rate is. So that's something that to look out for maybe when we are uh, making uh, selections between different types of diesel engine oil.
If you found this content useful, head on over to lubrication.expert. It's a website where there's tons more training courses, they're more structured, and it's available for about $22 US a month.